If you like Tony Robbins, you're going to love our guest today. He's a powerhouse when it comes to motivating you. He is the catalyst for getting things done. Today, we are talking with Kellen Flukiger. He is that person that you want in your corner to get things changing, to get things motivated, and to help you push forward. I highly recommend you looking Kellen up and getting involved with him. Everybody needs a coach. And I'm sure with Kellen's story, he can help you achieve your ultimate life. Let's not waste any more time and get into today's episode. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be around this wild, wacky, and sometimes disturbing world of ours. Yes, that's the intro to the Mindset Podcast, a weekly attempt to open eyes and shedding light on what's really going on in the world, all done by ripping apart the media madness that masquerades as news. Join me, Gareth Davis, every Sunday on the Mindset Podcast. You can find the show on all major podcasting services such as iTunes, Stitcher, and so on. Or you can go directly to the main Mindset website. That's www.mindsetcentral.com. Check out the Mindset Podcast. Bring your curiosity, your opinions, and a sense of humor. And remember that some worldviews are stranger than others. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now now. Today we have Kellen Flukiger with us. Kellen, could you please introduce yourself, let people know a little bit about you, and how you got to where you are today, please? Well, that's a long story. I'm 65, and I have lots of history. So I spent, uh, I've had an interesting life and career as a executive, as a musician, as a recording artist, as a career consultant in energy markets. And in the last 10 years, I've spent all my time transitioned to being a full-time business and life coach. Uh, I just say coach for clients around the world. You have spent your life going through a lot of things. You say that you come out of a depression, addiction, life-threatening illness, and a near-death experience. The cage breaker. You tout that you are a cage breaker and the catalyst to get it done. Yeah. That makes sense once you dig into the story of who Kellen really is. Let's get into the details of the depression first, because a lot of people deal with depression. What well, I'm happy well, to talk about it, and even though it carries a stigma, um, a lot. You know, once in a while, like a few years ago, Robin Williams committed suicide, and and then you know those kinds of things happen, and then uh, it raises its head, and we talk about it for a little while, and then it goes back down underneath the radar. Is yesterday's news? My my stuff started early. I was brought up in a very strict uh, religious household where. If you didn't do good, it wasn't just be a good boy, Johnny. It was you're, you're going to hell. And it was enforced with a lot of physical punishment, stuff that today would be felony child abuse. And so there was a lot of that. And the consequence of that for me, really, uh, and it was over everything. It didn't matter. A's at school, how I behaved, whether or not I told the truth every time. And then I learned to lie to protect myself and everything else. But the consequence for me was I internalized a truth. It isn't true, but I internalized it. 
And that was, I'm not good enough and I never will be. And so I spent a couple of really, really sad, but um, pervasive things came out of that. I became a, a liar, a pathological liar, practically, to protect myself. And that spawned this, I have a really, really good memory. So I never got caught and I was able to just sort of remember everything. But it made me live in a world that was not true. I said whatever I wanted to say to protect myself. And that was not good. And this not good enough means that I went on a rampage for decades trying to get the approval of, it was principally my mom who was the, the disciplinarian, the, the violent disciplinarian, I guess. And I needed to prove, I needed to get her approval. And so that led me to, uh, when I was in, a kid in grade school, apathy, and I got crappy grades. But when I went to high school and university, I got good grades and I got straight A's and I'm the honor roll. And, and then I got in business and I got high positions and got elevated and got up in the companies and, you know, got senior level executive positions and made a lot of money. But at the time I was never feeling good enough. Everything was not enough. So I always had this fear of being found out, the imposter syndrome, we call it all kinds of stuff. And at the same time, because my true love was music and music was not okay as a career in the context of my upbringing, because musicians are bad people, they do drugs and they are uh, you know, immoral, then I couldn't be a musician. And then I ended up being all the things that my mother was afraid I would be, even though I was in business. I ran a recording studio on the side for a while, and then I buried the whole thing. And by burying it, I sold it off and just got out of it and pursued the executive and consulting career with a vengeance. So that career took off. I made a lot of money, and I spoke, testified before Congress, and I had big contracts in the United States and Canada, did a bunch of stuff. But behind the scenes, I was a drug addict. I was uh, d destroyed relationships. It was a typical thing you see in movies where you have a double life, um, a very, very high profile facing the world. And everyone would have looked at me and said, raging success. Uh, but in behind the scenes, I was an addict. I was destroying relationships. I ended up getting you know, married and then divorced three times. And, you know, battleground behind me and had other relationships besides the official marriages that were all also disastrous and it was all because two things one i believed i couldn't be good enough and two every single time i got somewhere that looked good meaning i got a big promotion got a bunch of money got a big position or whatever my internal clock or thermostat said you shouldn't be here this is not okay and so then i would begin the slow or rapid process of self sabotage so then I would start to do things that would undermine it. And eventually I would either leave or the position would fall apart or I'd get fired or the relationship would end and I'd get divorced. And that happened over and over and over. I listed the number of times I started with drugs when I was 12 on and off at different periods. And I listed the periods of you know, drugs or relationships or addiction or divorce and through the life from 12 to 55 is when I finally realized what was going on and finally got some help. I never talked to anyone. I never, it was, you know, taboo to talk about your personal problems because you shouldn't have them anyway and you suck if you do, that kind of uh, doctrine. And so I never talked to anybody and I just kept trying to do this on my own. There were probably 20 different episodes varying in length from two years to five years during that uh, 40 years. So there's almost no time, zero years where I wasn't in trouble, somehow, seriously in trouble. It, whether or not one area affected the other, you know, just depended. I was quite successful at hiding stuff, functioning addict, functioning alcoholic, et cetera, et cetera. But it, I personally, as a person, was miserable. And at the same time, I learned to be completely disconnected from my feelings. I remember saying once to someone in 2000, which was 20 years ago, and about seven years before this all came to a head in 2007, which I'll get to in a minute, the divine intervention that changed everything. I said to somebody, I, I can be anybody you like. Tell me what I need to do, and I can be that. 
and I could do it so convincingly, kind of like character actors. And it didn't matter if it was a social situation, a business situation, I could be that. And inside, I had no feeling. I was just playing a part, and I could do it really well. So I was this sort of sick individual, afraid of being found out, having tons of secrets to find out, knowing that I wasn't good enough, desperate to win the approval of those who would never give it for decades. So that's how depression manifested itself for me uh, through all of those years until uh, the end of 2007. So that would have been when I was 52. Um, And finally, at that time, I had a 17 hour out of body experience, divine experience. And, you know, voice said that is enough or it is enough, not that it is enough. And I, I realized that, you know, this is time to change my life. So I'm 50 something years old. I've never talked to anyone. I've been, I was at the time a practicing addict, like thousands of dollars a week is, is this level of severity. And I was making so much money that didn't matter. It was, you know, lunch money. And, and that experience made me go from $3,000 a week as a Coke addict to zero in one day. Do it away. And I said, okay, if I got to do something different. I walked away from the contracts I had, which were, you know, very lucrative contracts, millions of dollars worth of stuff. And said, I got to start over in my life. And I'm mid fifties. So I did that. And that, that, divine intervention was the thing that started me on the path to healing that wasn't sudden healing but it was we've got to do something different so part of that divine intervention was this is a funny story uh for those that are interested all of the details are written in a book that i wrote called tightrope of depression my journey from darkness despair and death to light love and life which is on Amazon if anyone's interested. So part of the divine intervention was after that 17 hour out of body experience, two weeks later, I hadn't quit yet. Uh, that, that whole process of resigning and leaving took about a month. About two weeks later, I got tickets to a very high profile performance, musical performance in a very expensive venue in the city I was working in. And I got that kind of stuff all the time because the positions I held, I got things that would have been almost bribes, you know, all kinds of gifts, right? And so I had these two tickets to see this concert. Uh, For those of you that do classical music, the performer was Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, who is a spectacular and electrifying performer. Anyway, I was single again for the third time, and so I had an extra ticket. And I gave it away to somebody in the office. I said, who who wants classical music? Who wants to go see this? And then this lady came and said, I want it. I said, have I ever given you anything before? No. Okay, good. good. We'll see you there. So we met at the venue. And partway through the night, uh, the performance, which was, like I, like I said, electrifying, I had this overwhelming feeling, which I had very recently come to recognize. A voice said to me, you need to marry this woman. And I said, yeah, not going to happen. I haven't done so well in that department. Let's just drop that. And then after the performance, it was they were backstage passes, of course. And they came back and said, and you need to tell her tonight. And so... I argued quite a bit and lost the argument. So I did. And it went about like you would have expected. She freaked out and left. And, um, and we hadn't come together. So that was fine. A- anyway, later, it's her own experience. In two weeks, we were together. We uh, got married three months later after I had quit the position. She resigned from her positions. And we just struck out on this new adventure. And that was 13 and a half years ago. So she knew me and she knew me during the time I was, you know, managing, supervising the senior executive director of that position. She knew I was in trouble. She knew me, but I didn't know her very well, but everybody knew me because I was a boss, big boss. So she knew that and she took a chance anyway. She had her own set of experiences that said this was right. And that was a, you know, there were several things that out of body experience, then needing her in that spectacular way that made it clear to me that there was something else besides what I've been doing for the last 40 years. And so that's where it started. And that put us into 2008. At that time, after I walked away from all that, I said, okay, what do I know how to do? Are I going to do something completely different because I'm done with that other stuff? And I had a couple of offers to be 
CEOs of small companies in the energy industry, which is what I'd been in. And I turned them down because I knew it would take me right back to where I was. So I said, no, I'm not doing that. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I said, well, what I know I know how to do is I know how to help people do impossible things because that's what I'd been. That was my career built on the guy you call when stuff has to get done that can't get done. Okay. So that's what I knew. And I thought, well, what is that? I think that's a coach. So I decided I would study and become a coach because what, what I knew skill was that I had was to help people do hard things. So I did that. And gradually over the first few years, which would have been eight to 12, 2008 to 2012, you know, I, I came to grips with the decades of depression. Finally, in 2012, I began talking to a shrink and experimenting with way, admitting I, I have depression and I was diagnosed with severe MBD that probably started in my teens, which is why I say that. And so then I just began working on that. And, and my work today isn't really at all focused on depression per se, uh, but what it's focused on is people who live with a story that makes them addicted to mediocrity, settling for what's easy and obvious instead of what's possible. And I took the words cage breaker because a cage is how we often live. We're trapped in a cage. We can see through the bars what we want and we reach for it. We can't get there. And cage is an acronym that stands for, in the negative sense, compare abandon, uh, grumble, and excuse, or in a positive sense, create, achieve, grow, enjoy. And so breaking the cage is a metaphor for doing what I did, which is I'm done. I'm going to do something different. And in the process, since that time, I've written 13 books and done a bunch of other stuff. I speak in a lot of places, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a long monologue, but that's kind of some detail about what happened. Yeah, that's great. We love long monologues because it gets inside and people really need to understand each other. This is how we change ourselves. And that's what Dead America is about. Service to others. You tout this in everything you do in your social media. I love that. You know, helping others no matter where you are in life. Money is nice, but doing what you can with what you have is action and not excuse. You do that very well. How do you get organized enough out of all of the chaos in your mind to become a great coach like this? It's not an accident. So the divine intervention I talked about just got me to stop being an addict. But it didn't create a coach, and it didn't create the keywords that I use, and you've used a beautiful one that is one of my most powerful. I have three words that drive my life, love, create, serve. And those are the three words that I judge every action by. But those didn't come magically or automatically during those first few years, uh, 8 to 12 or 13, 14. As it goes along, you evolve. And I said, okay, I want to be a coach. Well, what does that mean? How do I help people? How do I talk to them? What does it mean to be a coach? So I went to some coaching stuff and they didn't teach me how to help people do hard things because I knew how to do that, but they taught me frameworks and stuff that are used in the coach process. So I went and did some studying, uh, but I realized what Kellen realized is lots and lots and lots of coaches, life coaches, business coaches, dating coaches, acting coaches, whatever, I realized that what, what resonated and appealed to me was, I'll use a, a cliche maybe, unleashing your true potential, which you've probably heard a million times. The truth is you, as you do this podcast series, everybody that listens to it and me, we're all created by the same God who is a divine being that had an intention for this. It's not an accident. We feel that yearning to serve that you talked about because that's how we were built. And we've beat it out of ourselves or created competition and the need to be cool in a way that has, has dampened that and in some cases destroyed it. But that's still a yearning that we feel. And that yearning to serve 
is what brings true fulfillment. And so love, create, serve. Or the, I can love somebody without their permission. I can choose to be a vessel of love and to be kind and to emanate light. I can choose to do that. I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need anybody to like me or anything else for that. And so that's in my control completely. And create is the second word. And, and by the way, love is the most powerful force in the universe and the foundation of everything good. So why wouldn't that be the prime directive? Create is just, it's an, a manifestation of our true nature. Like we're all creators. Everybody has gifts, talents. Some people have developed them. Some people haven't. Some people think they don't have them. Some people think, well, I might have, but it's too late. And all kinds of excuses. But the, I have a podcast series, too. It's called Your Ultimate Life. And I define your ultimate life as a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy that you create by serving others with your divine gift. And prosperity is cool. I've been in a place where I had so much money, I didn't know what to do with it. But I was miserable, and I certainly wasn't serving anybody. In fact, I was damaging people, right and left, myself included, but I certainly wasn't the only one by any stretch. And so that create is just an invitation or a directive, how you, depends on how you want to hear it, to seek out and develop and use your divine gifts to do good stuff. To, to create good, add good to the world is one way I like to say that. And the third word, serve, is our inclination. We are biologically built to do that. There's a flood of oxytocin that's released as a, as a that's the community feel-good hormone that we feel when we do good things for each other and we participate in community projects and stuff. So we're built to do that. And service is the manifestation in real life of, of love. Like love is a word, but it's really not. It's an action. It's a verb. And you, you see it when people make a choice to use their resources, whether they're physical or spiritual or emotional or mental resources, to bless somebody or to serve them or to lift them up or to alleviate suffering or, or however you want to describe that. And so I measure everything I do, the books that I write, how I do my coaching, the podcasts I do, the videos I create. Is there some way that I can serve somebody or say something in a way that this will resonate with someone to say, you know what? I need to wake up to my own divinity. I need to stop settling for mediocrity. I'm going to start today and at least take the first tiny step to change. That's wonderful. Your, your podcast is one of the best podcasts that I've listened to, by the way, and I highly oh, recommend you. it to everybody because it shows details that people normally don't look at. So get over there and check out the podcast. We'll leave links in the show notes for that for sure. Now, part of building your ultimate life, it's forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself, it opens up the doors to productivity. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I'd love to. Forgiveness is, uh, it, it, it gets me emotional, even as I think about it and talk about it. And I'll tell you why. I, I don't do things unless I'm going to be open and real. So some of the things that I talk about are still open and real for me. I don't think at all that I've reached some place that I'm whatever, because I don't. I, I do meditate two hours or more a day. I do have spiritual experiences all the time and a great connection to divine, but I built that. But I still have lots of stuff that I want to and I'm working on cleaning up. So, for example, I have 10 kids. Most of the 10 children don't talk to me because of the year, because of the broken relationships and the drug addictions and everything else. They blame me for all the struggles they've had in their life. Now, we're all responsible for our stuff because they're all adults and, you know, in their 20s, 30s and 40s. And so I get all that. But they still we still as people sometimes want to scapegoat. So I have a lot of work and it's a lot, it's a difficult thing to, to live with that. And so when you talk about forgiveness, some people confuse forgiveness with excuse, excusing. Forgiveness is not excusing. Somebody, I heard somebody say the other day, wow, that was really bad to do. I hope I can forgive myself. Well, I do too, whoever said that, but there's more pieces to it than that. 
if you go to any of the addiction recovery programs, 12 step or any of them, and I've been to a million of those, they all have the idea of some kind of restitution. So a lot of times when you hurt people or do things, you can't fix it. It's unfixable. That's fine. I mean, it's not good that it happened, but it did. We can't change the past. But there's two problems. One is you don't control and you never will whether somebody else wants to move into forgiveness or will forgive you or get past what you did or what they think you did or what they have allowed what you did to do to them. And you don't control that. So what you do instead is you do everything you can that's reasonable to apologize and to make it right. And sometimes the best you can do is to just be a light going forward. Because many things that we do or say to one another can't be fixed in the, you know, taken back or fixed. So you be good, do good, be a light, and, you know, that stuff going forward. So that is in the context of that forgiveness. You don't control whether others forgive you. You as an individual forgiving others, because none of us get through life without having been bashed, crashed, and hurt, sometimes accidentally and sometimes very calculated and intentionally. If you carry around anger toward that person any time at all, you're limiting your ability to connect with your power. You're carrying a bag of rocks you don't need to carry. Your backpack is full of stuff that you can't ever get rid of. That person may not care. That person may never ask forgiveness. That person may ask for forgiveness and you may choose not to forgive them and hold on to grudges and anger. Somebody said once it's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You can't do that or you can, but if you do, you're, you're holding yourself down. You're wearing lead shoes all the time when you're trying to fly. So choosing, and it is an internal process of choice to forgive and let go of the anger and resentment and negativity towards someone else is essential if you're going to do anything about reaching the full potential. Now, that doesn't mean to put yourself in harm's way. It doesn't mean to ignore the fact that something is dangerous or someone is dangerous. It doesn't mean that. That that would be stupid. But what it does mean is to quit carrying resentment and negativity and understand that each of us, including that person over there, is on their own path. And I don't control what they do, how they feel, and where they are any more than they control what I do, how I feel, and where I am unless we give them that authority. So that deals with others forgiving you. It deals with you forgiving others. And then we get to the hardest, sometimes the hardest one, which is forgiving yourself. That issue of forgiving myself was really, really difficult for me. And here's why. All of the things that my kids and others blamed me for because I was this depression thing where I'm not good enough, I willingly accepted that, and I lived in the place of self-loathing. I hate myself for everything I am and everything that I've done, not, that I've done. Nothing can fix it, and it will never, ever, ever be okay. I had one ex who said, "I wish I could wake up in a world without you," and she was trying to encourage me to commit suicide, which I tried a couple of times. And she desperately wanted me to, and her mom had committed suicide. And so she was trying to encourage that as a manifestation of her anger and hurt because our relationship was, um, had fallen apart. And, you know, I, I used, that used to make me mad and everything. It doesn't make me anything anymore. I just feel sad for those who live in that hurt and bitterness. Anyway, self-forgiveness is not excusing. It's not saying, oh, well, I did that bad thing. Gee, I hope I forgive myself. Wow, I need to forgive myself. That isn't it. I'm only human. None of that stuff is what I'm talking about. Forgiveness is simply a turning to a new way of being. And if you cannot, if I cannot turn to a new way of being and accept the process of change and growth, then essentially I'm damning or dooming myself forever to live in a state of non-productivity blame and self-loathing and i did that for years and that was the driver for lots of the alcohol and drugs and even the attempted suicide event so the learning that forgiving yourself is not excusing willful and callous and cruel acts that you may have done or did do to others you might look back and say how could i have done such a thing and the answer is i don't know I was cruel. It was, it was wrong. 
But to live forever in that self-hatred and loathing and accept the lie that you can never do anything good again or be okay because you did that, all that does is rob yourself and the world of all the good you could do from today forward. So I'm not advocating excuses. I am advocating eliminating bad behavior, changing and being a light going forward. And in that context, stopping or ending carrying the big bag of rocks that weigh us down when we live in that negative place where forgiveness is not part of our life. Any one of those three ways that I talked about. Yeah, that's an interesting take. So on your website, you have five principles to creating your ultimate life. And the first one starts with truth. Truth is something the world is really lacking nowadays. And being able to own up to your own actions takes that first step in truth. Could you walk us through a little bit about the principles of creating your ultimate life and how you came up with those? Yeah, and I don't have them in front of me, so sometimes I get the order mixed up. But let's do them one at a time. Truth is the foundation of all of it. And I teach a, a seminar called Five Essential Principles for Successful Entrepreneurs about uh, entrepreneurship. And it's the first one is the same principle. I don't call it truth. I call it taking responsibility. But it's founded on the same thing. I lived personally for a long time pretending that I could blame my mom, who beat me a lot, for everything that was wrong in my life. I blamed, I bl pretended I could blame, you know, depression or anything else. Those are, those are factors. Those are things that happen to us. And so they may contribute to whatever they contribute, but telling the truth, not only is, okay, I did that thing. I take responsibility, but it is also, and I now take responsibility to do whatever I need to do to get better, to improve to grow. So telling the truth, I, I, I use that in the book, The Results Equation, which is a book about from dream to done in five simple steps. We don't want to tell the truth about our bank accounts, about our effort, about where we spend our time. Someone says to me, I don't have time to do this, or I want so badly to start this business or to change my life. I just ask them one question. I say, well, bring me your calendar and your bank account, and we'll see what's important to you. Because that's the truth, where you put your money and where you put your time is what's important. And if, you know, you, we can tell ourselves and we do tell ourselves all kinds of stories, blame the weather, blame government, blame God, blame the economy, blame our childhood, blame everything else. And that's fine. And you're allowed to do that. But the consequences of living that way means you'll never get off of ground zero. So if you want to get past that blaming place, it starts with telling the truth. And the truth may include whatever somebody else did. Okay, that's true too. The next piece of truth is, like I said at the beginning, my mom did whatever she did. The, the thing I took away from that is I'm not good enough. And I let that principle rule my life until I stopped. And there, you know, there is a point in our lives where we say, I, I am at cause here. I get to take responsibility. I might need help. I might need to go see a shrink. I might need to go see a doctor. I got a dog downstairs that I was doctoring just before we got on this call. And that dog didn't ask for this big growth that's in between her second and third toe and her right foot. And so we're going to take her to the doctor to get that help. I, I saw some, a bunch of shrinks and tried different depression medications and have tried all kinds of things to adjust the chemistry in the body. The chemistry is what it is. If I take responsibility to do something about it, then I can go from not having interest in doing things, not wanting to perform, being afraid that I'll fail, which is where a lot of people stop, to I don't care. I'm going to try it anyway. I'm going to add good to the world whether anybody likes it or not. You know, that's my choice. And telling the truth is, is the key. Like if I say, why am I not moving? toward my goal, whatever it is, happiness, money, wellness. What, why am I not moving? I'm here. I, I tell a funny story. Not telling the truth is like, I am in Miami. Let's pretend I'm not, but I, let's pretend I'm in Miami. 
and I'm pretending I'm in Denver. And then I say, I want to go to New York. Well, if I pretend I'm in Denver and I want to go to New York, what's really going to happen is I'm going to drown out in the Bermuda Triangle because I pretended I was in Denver. And so I went straight east instead of north. Like not telling the truth means that we're going to take the wrong action. We'll talk to the wrong people. We won't get anything done right because we have pretended by not telling the truth. We were somewhere either financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically that we're not. If I pretend I'm a great mountain climber and I really am overweight and can't move and I go try to do a climb, I'm going to die because I wouldn't tell the truth about what I needed to get ready. Does that make sense? That's powerful. That's what we need right there. The second one, desire. Okay. So I think when, when God created us, uh, you know, desire to do stuff is one of the things he gave us each. We, nobody, nobody, no one that I know uh, or I've ever met wants to do nothing. Like you created this podcast. You have an itch to serve people. You want things to happen with this. And you want it to reach out and touch somebody's life. You have a desire. People have a desire. Now, sometimes that desire is weird. Like, I want to do dumb things, or I want to make so much money, or I want to hurt somebody, or whatever. But we have desires, and we have to identify them and then choose which ones we act on. And that the one accepting the desires that we have, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. Okay, there's four things I want. And I want to stay in bed all day. Yeah, but I want to get up and do some podcast episodes today, which it happens to be on my agenda. I want to, you know, whatever. Yeah, but I want to do this more. And one of the mistakes we make is we, go, we change the word want to into gotta or has to. I have to do this and I have to do that. You don't have to do anything. What you need to do is identify the true desires that you have and follow them. Now, it may be true that if you choose not to make money, you can't pay your rent and so you'll be on the street. Okay, but nobody says you have to make money. I want to do that worse than I want the consequences of not. And someone may think that's trivial, but changing our language to owning, which is part of that truth, to owning our true desire and labeling it what it is instead of what it isn't is a powerful way to harness those desires to cre- first identify and then create what you want in your life. And the third one we're going to talk about is imagination. Cool. Imagination. Every kid in the world is born with imagination. You know, when I was a kid, my brother and I used to play all kinds of stuff in bed at night in bunk beds. And we played and played and played and we couldn't see each other and it was dark. And our imaginations filled in the blanks and were full of texture and richness and we had whole worlds and empires and, you know, all kinds of stuff that we did without any props or anything, just with the language and imagination. And one of the things that I teach in the results equation is you can't create what you can't imagine. So one of the things that's a key or a key to creating your ultimate life is to have a picture of what that really is. That's why in the podcast, I gave a definition. Somebody may disagree with that definition, but my definition is that life of purpose, prosperity, and joy you create by serving others with your divine gifts. And so when I say ultimate life, I have a clear picture of that. That means purpose. I wake up every day excited and I can imagine myself and therefore I create it. Imagination is the first step of creation. I I get up every day excited, today included. It's minus 30 outside. I got up today excited, wanting to do things. And that purpose is what drives me. Prosperity, I use that word on purpose. A lot of people think of money, but money is only one small piece of prosperity. Anybody that's been through trials and tribulations knows health, relationships, All that stuff easily trumps money. And joy is something, again, that you you choose, and your imagination is the key. Like, I see myself prosperous. I see myself with purpose. I see myself on fire and with joy. And my wife happens to be named Joy. That woman who was 
given to me in that divine direction or, you know, told me to go essentially propose to her the first night and all of that kind of thing were choices. And I imagined those things and having a rich and textured and deep imagination with details and excitement and feelings is a key to creation because it fires your drive. It fires that desire to make it real. And it's powerful when you want to overcome stuff. The next one is big. It's optimism. You know, there's a doctor named Dr. Martin Seligman who did a 20 year study about optimism. I think he wrote a book called learned optimism. And some people call optimists stupid, Pollyanna, not realistic view of the world and pessimism is a mark of sophistication that doctor after a 20-year study of optimism and pessimism and its consequences in both the boardroom and the bedroom and on the playing field and everywhere else high-powered people he said pessimism may be the mark of sophistication but it is a costly one because his study showed in without question over 20 years People who choose to be optimistic, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. People who choose to be optimistic make more money than similarly talented people who choose not to be. They do better in relationships. They're happier. And they live several years longer. So they do better in all measurable areas of life to someone who's exactly as talented, has exactly the same breaks and opportunities as someone who chooses a pessimistic view. Now, there are some reasons for that. There are absolute scientific reasons. When I'm pessimistic, my body is filled with a neurochemical cocktail, and that neurochemical cocktail narrows our creativity, reduces our option, our ability to see options. It literally shrinks my world of influence and creativity. When I'm in the same situation and I choose to be optimistic, my creativity index and measurable scores go up. My ability to perform goes up. My ability to do difficult things goes up. My ability to solve puzzles goes up. Make money goes up. So measurably, the chemistry in your body changes when you're optimistic and you're pessimistic. And optimism produces a chemistry in the body that is creative, powerful, energetic, and attractive. People are attracted to light and to optimism and that sort of thing. And optimism is not being silly. It's not pretending there are problems. An optimist looks at a situation and says, there's got to be a way to solve this. A pessimist looks at the same situation and says, crap, we're screwed. That yes. change right there is the difference. Yeah, that's big. Optimism, we all need to incorporate it into our lives because we have to see the good in the bad. And that's just part of life. The fifth and final principle is perseverance. So that's beautiful. And that's kind of obvious, but it ties into what you asked about earlier, which is the sickness and near-death experience. <laughs> Two and a half years ago, in June of 2018, my wife and I decided to go on a cruise. Now, neither one of us, despite having made all kinds of money, I'd never been on a cruise. I just never was interested. So we decided to go on a cruise to the Baltic Sea for 10 days. We went to St. Petersburg and Helsinki and some other cities. And it was fun, and we had a good time. Toward the end of that, I got sick. And the last day in Amsterdam before we flew home, I got sick, and I had a fever that was so bad I... I could hardly move. I barely got on the plane to get home and had cold and hot sweats all the way home. And it was a 14 hour, 14 hour flight over the pole from, because Edmonton's in Canada. So you fly over the pole anyway from Amsterdam to Edmonton. When I got home, I went straight home with bed. And that was the second day of being sick. Monday all day I was sick. Tuesday all day. Wednesday, the fever let up a little bit, but I was still really sick. Thursday was bad. And Friday, I finally decided I better go into the walk-in clinic, which is what they have here in Canada, before you go, you know, like to the hospital or something. So I went to our walk-in clinic, and this is the fifth day of illness around noon or one o'clock or something. They had a sign in the clinic that said, if you've got a cough or a fever or something, tell the attendant. Well, I was extremely ill, and I knew it. 
So I sent Joy in and asked her to ask the nurse to come out to see if they were going to let, you know, if I should come in. So I said, warn them. So I did. She took one look at me, like literally one look and said, you can't even come in here. Go to the hospital right now. There's nothing we can do to you. Go to emergency. So I did and got there, you know, in the afternoon. And it's funny because in most emergency rooms, you know, you might wait anywhere from one to five hours, depending on how many people are there, what time of day it is and everything else. So I said, I expected to sit there for a couple of hours and I huddled over in the corner, sick as a dog. And uh, I must, I must have really looked bad because in 10 minutes I was in a private room <laughs> uh, in the, not in the hospital, but in the ER area. And so anyway, it got worse from there. And the doctor asked me all these questions and asked Joy all these questions. And he came back and <clears throat> he said, well, at a minimum you have a, an extremely bad pneumonia in both lungs, but something else is wrong and we don't know what it is yet. So wait. I waited another couple of hours and I started feeling something really strange. And so it, this was about five or six or seven o'clock at night. And I sent Joy home. I said, I don't know how long I'm going to be sitting here. We'll call you when there's something. And I started to meditate in my, it, just to go inside of myself to see what was going on. And I could feel my body separating from my spirit. I could feel a sense of separation. And so I, I came out of my meditation and I sent a text to Joy. By now it was 10 o'clock or something, and 11, and she'd gone to bed. So she didn't see it, but I, the doctor had come back and said, we're going to have to put you in the ICU. And we're also going to probably put you in isolation, biological isolation, because we don't know what's wrong with you. So I sent her a text and I said, I see three lines, I see you. And, oh, the doctor then came back another time, a few minutes, and asked me the question you never want to hear. They said, do we have permission to intubate you or do whatever we need to do to preserve your life? And I sat there stunned, looking at the doctor, thinking, holy crap, this is bad. And I said, okay. So then they left, and they were you know, looking for making an ICU bed and isolation, all this stuff ready. So I sent Joy the text and it said, I see you. Second line said, isolation slash intubation. And the third line said, I may be dying because of what I felt. And she didn't see that. About an hour later, I was in a coma. I was gone. So they stuck me in ICU. They stuck me full of tubes and on a ventilator and all that kind of stuff with no idea what was wrong with me, but that I knew I was dying. About one or two o'clock, they called Joy and she got the call you never want to get from the hospital. <laughs> the nurse said to her, are you coming? And she said, what are you talking about? And then she saw my text, right? <laughs> and so it was quite a panic. And I was gone for the next two and a half to three weeks. I think it was 17, 18 days. I don't know. In a coma. And for the first several days, they had no idea what I had. And so they just, I, like I was all geared up and intubated and everything. And they were filling me full of every high tech antibiotic known to man and also doing every test they could do to figure out what I had. <clears throat> it turns out what I had was protizing MRSA, which is a super bug hmm. in both lungs. And it was literally killing me. They told me later that the, the strain that I had had a 10 day mortality rate of 100% funny we talk about mortality rate with covid and we talk about two and a half or three percent my mortality rate was 100 percent if you're not in the hospital and it dropped to only 60 percent if you were in the hospital well i got to the hospital at the end of day five <laughs> and huh. during that time i was in a coma and that's when i had the near death experience and three distinct and individual conversations with god at the door a literal a doorway between life and eternity and i wrote about those in a, another book called meeting god at the door conversations, choices, and commitments of a near-death experience. That experience, and after three weeks, I came out of it, and I, I, didn't, I didn't die because I chose not to. The first of the conversations was a simple question. It was funny because I, I, I came to, and my, the spirit came to. My body was you know, dying over there. But my spirit came to, and I was in a gray room, and I was horizontal like I was in bed, but I could see over there a door. And it was a regular doorway, and it didn't have a door, but it was a jam. 
On the other side, it was light, and the light wasn't streaming through, but it was just light, quite, on the other side. And I wanted to be at the door, and so then I was at the door, and I was leaning on the door jamb on my side, and there was another person on the other side, all white, leaning against the door jam on the other side. So we were having a casual conversation, and there was no question where I was, like what the door was, and who that was, and who I was. Like that was really clear. And the first conversation was one question. Do you want to come home? And it hit me like a ton of bricks because I knew what the question meant and I knew where the door was and I knew what was going on. And then I start thinking about all the things that I was trying to do and committed to do. And that because by then, you know, that was only two and a half years ago. So my business is well underway and I'm trying to help these people and everything else. And I thought it through and the answer was I'm not ready. It took a lot longer than that. It was a lot longer conversation. But the answer was, I'm not ready. I got stuff to do. And so that was the first conversation. And then the next day there was another one, and the next day there was another one. And we probably don't have time for me to tell all those, but they're in the book, Meeting God at the Door. So that was the near-death experience, and I came to, and how this has to do with perseverance, is when I got out of the hospital after a month, I'd lost 35 pounds, and I was completely flatlined physically. I looked like a survivor from a concentration camp, and uh, I could barely, I couldn't walk. I could crawl, uh, barely. And I, I'd been pretty physically fit most of my life, and, uh, you know, second degree black belt, a couple of martial arts, and I've always sort of measured my fitness in terms of how many push-ups I can do, right? Like, there's never been a time in my life even when I was overweight that I couldn't hit the floor and do 40. I tried about the third or fourth day I was home to do something, and I laid down on the floor, and I couldn't get my nose out of the carpet. I remember the carpet hairs tickling my nose, right, and I couldn't get up. So the perseverance part is, okay, this is a long road back. I am completely flatlined. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, for the last two and a half years, that's been part of my project, which is to get myself back into physical shape and to get my body back because I was allowed to stay <laughs> and to have a purpose and mission. And nothing has happened except that has been strengthened. And I've been able to do that with perseverance. And so that is a story to give the example both about the near death and perseverance. You can do anything you want if you don't quit. If I aim in a direction and I keep walking, I'll eventually get there no matter what. There's no stopping you or anyone from getting where you want to go. <clears throat> Simply a question of going through the valley of death or the mountain of madness or whatever it is you got to walk through to get where you want to go. And you, giving up is always an option, but if you want to get where you want to go or create the life that you have envisioned, that you have imagined, that you want really badly, perseverance is required. That's powerful testimony. Now, I want to be respectful of time here. I do have one other question for you. You've written a lot of books. Are they going to come out on audiobook? Yes. I love narrating, and I haven't done any yet. I have a good narration voice, and I'm going to narrate them myself. Uh, I, I say yes without hesitation because it's on the list of things to do, and they're not done yet. <laughs> but I, I will can't be doing wait. all of them in that way, yeah. yes. <clears throat> I cannot wait for that because uh, I'm, a, I'm an audio kind of guy. How can people get a hold of you? get involved with what you're doing and connect with you. My email is my name, coach Kellen Klukiger at gmail.com. And yeah, you'll have to look at the show notes to figure out how to spell the name. Coach Kellen Flukiger at gmail.com. That's easy. The other way is uh, friend me on Facebook and send me a message. I regularly use Facebook messenger to talk to people and answer questions. And, you know, I, I intentionally keep my friends below 4,000 instead of five so that I have plenty of room for people that want to chat and get acquainted and do whatever. I'm always available to have chat and conversation with people. I have a website, www.kellenflukiger, no surprise, .com. And again, I'll spell it right. On there, you'll see places to get, you know, books. And I have some courses. One is how to create time or creating time for joy and productivity. Uh, one is how to manage or create money. One is 
four steps to awesome client creation. I have like a dozen courses that are not all up there yet. Some of them are. I'm in the process of creating the others that are all founded on the idea that you can have anything you want if you're willing to take the steps and take the action. So Facebook, I have a YouTube channel called Ultimate Life Formula, but any direct connection, uh, my email and Facebook Messenger would probably be the easiest. Very okay. powerful person, Kellen Flukiger here. Get involved with him, look him up. All the links are in the show notes. Kellen, thank you for joining us today. You have an awesome afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your questions, and I hope that your listeners find some value and encouragement in what we've talked about. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon wherever you may be.